Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome to The Briefing with me, Gloria De Piero. The Prime Minister is touring the north of England and Scotland to promote his levelling up agenda. We'll be hearing from voters in Lee. Also, we'll speak to Chair of the Women and Equality Select Committee, Conservative MP Caroline Noakes. And we bring you our latest edition of our exclusive Real Me series of sit-down interviews with MPs. Today is the Conservative MP, former Minister Caroline Danid. First, it is the news with Rosie Wright. Good afternoon, it is 12 o'clock. I'm Rosie Wright, here to keep you up to date on GB News. Boris Johnson's going to travel to Europe later this week to make a last-ditch attempt to try to stop Russia invading Ukraine. The Prime Minister plans to hold talks with world leaders as the crisis reaches what's being called a critical juncture. Downing Street says Moscow could be planning to invade at any moment, and so the aim of the Prime Minister's meetings is to bring Russia back from the brink of war. The Minister for Armed Forces, James Heapy, told GB News, we need to remember that Ukraine is not part of NATO. We need to be absolutely clear that Ukraine is not part of NATO. NATO should not, must not extend the uh, umbrella of collective security to non-signatories to the treaty, because at a time of acute geopolitical crisis, blurring the lines around Article 5 could list to lead to the fracture of the alliance and actually leads to uncertainty that could cause miscalculation and unnecessary escalation on the part of the Russians. A public inquiry into the wrongful conviction of sub-postmasters and mistresses of theft, fraud and false accounting will begin today. Over 700 former employees were impacted because of a flawed accounting computer system on the post office branches that the post office branches used called Horizon. Well, the inquiry is going to look at whether the post office knew about the IT issues and its handling of them. The Labour Party leader, Sir Keir Starmer, confirmed he received death threats after the Prime Minister claimed he failed to prosecute the paedophile Jimmy Savile. Speaking to BBC Radio Newcastle, Sir Keir said that Boris Johnson's comments were wrong and that they fed into a right-wing conspiracy theory. The Met Police launched an investigation into online threats against Sir Keir following Mr Johnson's comments in the House of Commons. A police manhunt is underway to try to find a convicted sex offender who absconded from an open prison in Lincolnshire over the weekend. Police say Paul Robson, who's serving a life sentence for attempted rape and indecent assault, presents a danger to women and young children. The 56-year-old was reported missing at around 7 o'clock yesterday morning. Lincolnshire police are urging anyone with information or confirmed sightings to call 999. A Russian figure skater who failed a drugs test at the Winter Olympics in Beijing is going to be allowed to compete at the event. 15-year-old Camilla Valieva faced the prospect of becoming the youngest athlete to be banned for doping during the Olympic Games. But a court of arbitration says the teenager's case is an exceptional circumstance and no provisional suspension should be imposed. Unvaccinated teenagers can now travel to Spain as long as they have a negative PCR test. The country has reversed its policy demanding that UK visitors between the ages of 12 and 17 are double jabbed. The change coincides with the start of half term, which for many of us in the UK begins today. Travel expert Simon Calder, though, told UB News the timing is terrible. 
The tourism minister in Spain doesn't realise that actually most schools broke up on Friday for half term, or an awful lot of them did, and therefore the fact that on Monday um, the, the Spain says, oh yeah, we've just noticed that it's really difficult for 12-year-olds to get jabbed, so we'll let you take a test instead. If they said that two weeks ago, we wouldn't be where we are now, but as it is, many families have cancelled holidays altogether or gone to alternative destinations. A review into the healthcare system over the last 10 years has found stark ethnic inequalities across the board. That's according to the director of the NHS Race and Health, Dr Habib Naikvi. He said the report showed evidence of a pay gap within the NHS workforce that affected black, Asian, mixed and other groups. It also found black children were 10 times more likely to be referred to mental health services via social services than a GP compared with white children. A new cervical screening campaign is urging anyone eligible in England between the ages of 25 and 64 to go for an appointment. Data shows one in three don't take up the offer of being tested with research suggesting that embarrassment is the most common reason to miss an appointment. The new campaign is aiming to raise awareness. Screening is estimated to prevent 70% of cervical cancer deaths. That could, that number could be as high as 83% if everyone attended their appointment. New restrictions in Scotland that could ban households from setting off most fireworks in their garden are being discussed today. The proposed measures would enable councils to create control zones, banning the most types of fireworks in certain areas, including back gardens and on private land. A Scottish Parliament committee is considering the change, which could also include limiting the sale of fireworks to 37 days a year, with a focus on dates surrounding major events like Bonfire Night, Hogmanay and Diwali. And some breaking news for you. Clarence House has just announced that the Duchess of Cornwall has tested positive for coronavirus. Of course, we found out last week that her husband had tested positive for the infection too. We'll keep you up to date here on GB News and I'll bring you more news as it happens. Now, though, let's head back to Gloria for the briefing. Coming up this hour on The Briefing, the Prime Minister is in Scotland and the north of England promoting his levelling up agenda. We'll hear from voters in Lee, a seat that went blue at the last election for the first time in nearly a century. I'll be joined by Conservative MP Caroline Noakes, who will discuss the importance of select committee. She's chair of the Women and Equalities Committee. And we bring you the latest addition to our exclusive sit-down interviews with MPs this week with Conservative MP and former Minister Caroline Dynage. Give me your political briefing. Send in your views and opinions by emailing gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews. Prime Minister has hit the road to drive forward his levelling up campaign. The Prime Minister will visit Scotland and the north of England to promote that levelling up agenda. Mr Johnson, who is trying to get his scandal hit premiership back on track, will begin his levelling up tour with a visit to a manufacturing site in Scotland later. He'll travel to the northwest to see how new technology is being used to tackle the backlog for cancer treatment. Well, I'm now joined by GB News Northwest reporter Bradley Harris, who's in Lee in Greater Manchester. Bradley has been testing the temperature of voters in Lee. Hi, Bradley. Hi, Gloria. Yeah, I'm in the ex-mining town of Lee, currently in Lee Market at the moment. As you'd say, testing that temperature on what the people here think. So of course, there's over 40,000 people that live in this town and it was back in 2019 where some voters did the unthinkable and voted for the Conservative Party, some of which for the very first time. This is a Labour red wall seat, historically changed when James Grundy took the seat in 2019. Once a seat held by the current Mayor of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham. Of course, for many people, they voted for the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, and the Conservative Party because Boris Johnson was a bit different, some people tell me, to other politicians. He was a breath of fresh air. Uh, some people saw the party as the only way out of the European Union. But it's more than just Brexit. People here see a very deep divide, not just with the North and South, but with the funding that they see coming from Westminster. 
Boris Johnson, as you say, Gloria, is on a trip of the northwest later this week. People want to see levelling up really uh, being concrete here in the north. They want to see money being pumped into places like Lee Market here. Some stallholders tell me and their customers that they'd like to see improvements just with the market itself, let alone the high street and other areas of the town that they feel have been neglected. But I've been hitting the high streets myself to find out what people think. Let's just hear some of their thoughts now. I, I voted Conservative last time. Um, basically, to get us out of the EU. And it was focusing on the future rather than playing games and focusing on the past. And that's where I like voting. I will probably go with Labour because of the Conservatives just broke from 2020's Christmas party. That was illegal. And of course, the thing is, but with Boris Johnson and saying that already the right man, I do not at all like the guy, I dislike him. And, and of course I'm right, because at this moment, I think he should resign. So I've always voted Labour. I mean, I just thought that Labour does win this time round. I've always voted Labour before, but last time I voted for Boris because I thought he'd do what he said he would and get us out of the EU, which is what I voted for him for, which he did. And also, I, I, I think it's all right. I know a lot of people say he's daft and a bit, but I think he does what he says he will do. So, yeah, I'd vote for Boris again. Yeah. Would you vote for, you know, Boris Johnson again, the Conservative no. Party? No, no why is that? Not. Boris needs sacking. <laughs> yeah, he had a party at Downing Street and, like, we was all in our house and no family was away. We weren't allowed to party, so what, what's the difference for him? Yeah. What about Keir Starmer? He's a hex hat. Um, yeah, I would back Boris for the simple reason we've not had any clear, real... Uh, ideas from the Labour Party since before Jeremy Corbyn, except for, oh, well, we'll bring you back into, into the European Union. So, uh, and, yeah, I know about Partygate and all the rest of it, but we're looking at a cost of living now. Potentially people dying in the homes of cold, can't afford the heating bills. We've got more important things to deal with. And as we've already got a settled government in place, it's better to just stick with it, because you can't outweigh the good that he has done. He got us out of Europe. Again, with the vaccines, we know we have the best, arguably, in the world. Uh, so, yeah, I would, I would back Boris again. If you could describe Boris Johnson in one word, what would it be? Uh, libertarian. That's just a snapshot of what some people here in Lee think. And, Gloria, it's interesting, isn't it, because the pandemic has really exposed the government in more ways than one, particularly over the last few months. But for some people here, they tell me that anybody in Boris Johnson's seat would have had a difficult time of it. And actually, as Boris is saying, they want him to get on with the job and actually carry on with his levelling up agenda. Others, though, as you heard from some of the people there that I've been speaking to, that's it. They're not voting again. Uh, it's a waste of a vote they're not going to be backing the Conservative Party. It'll be interesting to see uh, what would happen if people could vote today, who they'd be voting for. But Boris Johnson himself, as I say, is going to be in the North West later this week, and he'll certainly be wanting to win back some of the voters that have lost the confidence that they had back in 2019. Bradley, thanks so much for that. Really interesting to hear those voices from Lee. Thank you. Coming up after the break, we speak to the chair of the Women and Equalities Select Committee, Caroline Noakes MP. Before that, it is time for your weather. Hi there, I'm Aidan McGiven. Some seriously stormy weather on the way for later this week, but for the rest of Monday at least, cloudy and breezy. Rain or showers turning a little drier later for a time before more rain arrives overnight. The focus for the wet weather, I think, at first this afternoon across northern England into the Midlands, East Anglia as well. The rain eventually easing away to the east. Further showers follow for Wales, the southwest, parts of Scotland, Northern Ireland as well. Some heavy downpours, some hill snow for Scotland and a brisk breeze. I think temperatures at around 6 to 9 Celsius in the north, perhaps a 10 Celsius in places in the south. Clearing skies then for a time on Monday evening and a touch of frost possible in places before the next bout of cloud and wind and rain arrives from the west by the end of the night.
That rain heavy across western parts and falling as snow of the hills of northern England as well as parts of Scotland. But the weather fronts are lined up to the Atlantic to the west of us and these lows will deepen significantly as they arrive from Wednesday onwards. Meanwhile, ahead of these, the weather front across northern and western parts of the country as we start off Tuesday will bring some damp or wet weather in places. It does ease away. It pushes through during the morning, perhaps lingering across southern counties of England for a time into the early afternoon. Brighter skies follow. A brisk wind, again gales in exposed northern and western parts of Scotland and hill snow above around 200 metres in any showers that follow for Scotland and northern England. But some clearer and drier weather for the second half of Tuesday for the southern half of the UK. Then yet more rain arrives to the west on Tuesday night, some heavy rain at times along with a brisk wind. This isn't the stormy weather. I think that's to come on Wednesday night and also on Friday. So stay tuned to the forecast this week because there could be some impacts from that. I'm Liam Halligan. Join me every weekday at 1 p.m. for On The Money, your daily dose of economics, business and consumer news. I've got 25 years experience covering economics and finance. We hold grown up discussions with a host of experts who really know their stuff. We can't buy gas and store it. That was a mistake, wasn't it? I think it was a mistake. Even you, Liam, don't have a crystal ball. Inflation's a real threat. Every weekday at one, you're on the money. Join me, Arlene Foster, for the briefing on GB News. Every Friday at 3 p.m., I'll give you all the latest political news and analysis, and we'll have a robust live debate. To make sure that you're caught up on all of the biggest issues of the day, we'll bring on experts in their field. I'll ask the questions that you'd like to ask we're not afraid to tackle discussions from all perspectives, including yours. Don't forget The Briefing with me, Arlene Foster, every Friday at 3 p.m. on GB News. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Now, campaigners say backlogs in the criminal justice system are allowing rapists and sex offenders to remain at large for longer. The Criminal Bar Association says some victims have been left suicidal after delay lengths have doubled in two years in some cases. Joining me now is Caroline Noakes, Chair of the Women and Equalities Select Committee. Hi, Caroline, how are you? Good to see you. It's, I think it's your first time on my show. You're very welcome. It is indeed my first time, so lovely to see you, Gloria, and uh, looking forward to chatting through some of these issues with you. 
Wonderful. And we are going to talk about the work that you more generally conduct as chair of this important select committee. But I would just like to start, if I may, by asking you about that research showing that that backlog of rape trials in Britain has more than doubled in two years. What's going on here? Well, I think we've seen a, a catalogue of um, different issues all coming together. So we saw the rape review, which I think was uh, published, um, I'm going to say around about six months or so ago, maybe slightly more than six months. We've now seen these figures about backlogs in uh, rape and sexual assault trials. We know that there are ongoing concerns from women about uh, the epidemic of violence. Uh, and harassment that they face on the streets every single day. And it just looks as if there needs to be a far more comprehensive package from the government about what they're doing to address not only the issue of uh, the court system, but also the underlying causes of male violence against women. Do you think if the government wanted to address a backlog like this, and your job is to scrutinise um, the work of, of the government, do you think it, it, it is as simple as if they wanted to address it, they could? Look, I don't think anything when it comes to the criminal justice system is simple. I know that we've seen uh, quite a significant investment announced in tackling backlogs. I think there's a, a billion pounds going into the court system. But actually, it's, it's far more fundament, fundamental than that. We need to see... Uh, higher quality investigations by the police. We need to see the police working much more collaboratively with the Crown Prosecution Service. We need to see the courts and tribunal service working so that we don't see these backlogs and so that victims of serious sexual crimes get the support that they need through every step of the process. So I really welcome things like the independent sexual violence advisors. I welcome the government's stated commitment to tackle these backlogs, but we begin to be at the point where we just need action. We need to see something done as opposed to, to plans and reviews and programmes. It, it has to be about getting results now. You have a big remit on your select committee. I've been looking at some of the work that you have been doing, calling for new legislation to make large companies publish data on their ethnicity pay gap. Just tell us why you want to why you're calling for that and what you think it might achieve? Well, we saw the uh, introduction of mandatory gender pay gap reporting way back in 2017 now. And the government's been looking at the issue of ethnicity pay gap reporting since sort of 2018-19. But we've not, we've not seen any action. We've not seen Bayes come forward with proposals. Whilst large companies made it very clear to us, and we heard from the CBI, from the Chartered Institute for Personnel Development, the business want to do this. They want to have that transparency. They know by shining a spotlight on these gaps, they will be able to highlight the, the scale of the challenge and drive the gaps down, which is, is what we want. We want to see equal pay uh, for people from all ethnicities, from both genders. And I think it's really important that uh, the government, instead of just, again, just talking about it, says, hang on, we had a consultation on this that reported in 2019. It's now 2022, we're three years on, and companies want a framework whereby they can report so that they know that things are being compared equally. They want to understand what the challenges are around that data. And rather than uh, introduce voluntary schemes of their own where they might be compared unfairly to their competitors, they're saying to the government, please give us some guidelines. Talk about a menopause revolution at the moment. Your committee has heard evidence on what we need to do uh, about the menopause or how we can help women going through the menopause. What do we need to do to make talk of a menopause revolution a reality? Look, we've seen some great action from campaigners like Davina McCall and my brilliant parliamentary colleague, Carolyn Harris, who, who joined the Women and Equalities Committee just this last week. Um, on the, the issues around hormone replacement therapy. What my committee is specifically looking at is menopause in the workplace and what employers can do to support their, uh, their menopausal or perimenopausal employees, whether it be through uh, really quite minor adjustments, whether it's just about a, a culture of transparency and openness and making it possible for women to talk about this issue, which uh, we've made huge strides forward in the last few years, but there's still a mountain to climb where uh, HR directors don't feel instantly awkward when women start talking about the menopause. So we are, I would say, approaching the end of a really enormous piece of work on this. We've had some evidence from lawyers, from campaigners, from healthcare professionals, you name it, who've come and given us their view on how we can 
best support uh, women going through the menopause. We had a group of employers come in last week who were giving us some best practice uh, hints and tips that their organisations have been through. But it really is about making sure that there are the necessary adjustments, making sure that women aren't forced to use disability discrimination legislation in order to bring uh, a case to tribunal, which is very often the route that's used at the moment. And you know, the menopause is many things. It can be uh, debilitating, it can be uncomfortable, it can be anxiety inducing, but it's not a disability. And we know that half the population will go through it at some point in their lives. So we have to make sure that the support's there. We've touched on ethnicity and on gender. I want to ask you about social class. Isn't that the bigger source of inequality? And is that something that your committee uh, would look into? Absolutely. And when the committee uh, was re-established after the 2019 general election, that was one of the issues that we discussed, whether we could look at social mobility and uh, the barriers that were in place for uh, people from different socioeconomic backgrounds. Now, look, when we, when we first started talking about that, it wasn't even within the remit of the Government Equalities Office. And it's really important to stress that that's absolutely the role that we have, is to scrutinise the work that the government is doing. But uh, within a few weeks, we had an announcement from the government that they were setting up the new Social Mobility Commission um, and adding it to the work of the, the Government Equalities Office. So absolutely, the, gov the committee is able and will be scrutinising the government on uh, things like levelling up, how well that's working, whether levelling up should just be a, a geographic concept or whether it should also be about uh, deprivation and, and comparative deprivation. And it's very, very easy to consider levelling up in only geographic terms. But actually, I sometimes point to some of the London boroughs where you can have the highest levels of affluence literally right next door to, to the most significant levels of deprivation. And if we're going to be talking about levelling up, then it has to be uh, for all areas, for all geographies, for every uh, ethnicity, for every gender, to make sure that we're addressing all of the differences and all of the challenges that there are. Uh, just on the news this morning, Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, has revealed that he has received death threats after Boris Johnson's claims that the Labour leader failed to prosecute Jimmy Savile. Your reaction to that, Caroline? Well, look, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure that we improve the, um, the content and the quality of our political discourse and reducing ourselves to chucking vile insults at each other absolutely incites uh, people in the wider public to behave badly both towards politicians and towards each other. I've always said that the language we use in the chamber reverberates around outside, in the outside world. And, and we should be raising the tone, setting the tone, not allowing ourselves to be dragged into, into gutter politics. And so, look, I was very outspoken last week when I said I thought the Prime Minister should uh, apologise for his uh, insinuation that somehow Sir Keir Starmer was personally responsible for the failure to prosecute Jimmy Savile. I still hold by that view. I think politicians sometimes need to be brave and apologise when they get something wrong. And we saw the Prime Minister lose one of his most senior advisers over uh, that slur. And to be frank, I think she made a very compelling argument as to why the Prime Minister needed to apologise. And finally, uh, some MPs have submitted a letter of no confidence in the Prime Minister. He is still in position. Not enough letters have gone in. Does that mean he's out of the woods? No, I don't think it means he's out of the woods at all. I think there are some important tests coming up for him, uh, not least the uh, conclusion of the Met investigation into what happened in Downing Street, the publication of the full Sue Gray report. Remember, we've only seen a, a partial report to date. But I suspect that colleagues are, are hanging on perhaps until the May local elections. And I think that's a, a huge tragedy. We will see good Conservative councillors up and down the country who have done nothing more than work hard for their local communities at every possible opportunity, who might well lose their seats because trust in politics has been diminished. And I think that's a, a tragic thing that we are allowing trust to be reduced in this way. The vast majority of members of parliament, of councillors, of whatever political party, simply do their best. They work hard to represent the people who have elected them. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to try to rebuild that trust restore trust and to keep working hard to represent people who are, 
are brave enough to elect us. And finally, finally, um, um, briefly, if you would, if viewers are listening uh, to what you have been saying about the work of your committee and they have views about what inquiries you should launch next, is there a way for the public to feed in to what committee work uh, you should prioritise? Yeah, absolutely. And we, at the start of every inquiry, have a call for evidence where anybody can respond, whether it's via our website or in writing. We're about to launch an enormous inquiry into the cultures underpinning male violence against women. And I want to hear from women as to what they think can be done, whether it's through education, through sport, uh, through the criminal justice system, to tackle those underlying cultures that have made misogyny, harassment um, acceptable talk to you. I hope it's the first appearance of many. Um, all the best to you, Caroline. Thank you. Caroline Noakes, Chair of the Women and Equality Select Committee there. After the break, we've an exclusive interview with Caroline Dynage, Conservative MP and former minister. She spoke to me about her biggest regret as an MP and how lucky she is to be married to her best friend. It is Valentine's Day. First, it's your news update. Very good afternoon to you. It is 12.30. I'm Rosie Wright here to keep you up to date on GB News. Boris Johnson says the situation in Ukraine is very, very dangerous and he's urged the Russian president to step back from the edge of a precipice. Speaking in Fife, the Prime Minister said he'd be doing everything he can to help the diplomatic process, that there was still time for Vladimir Putin to step back. This week, Boris Johnson will travel to Europe, holding talks with world leaders in an attempt to stop Russia invading Ukraine and de-escalate the current crisis. The Duchess of Cornwall is self-isolating after testing positive for coronavirus. Clarence House made the announcement this afternoon. It's the first time she's had the infection, catching it just days after the Prince of Wales tested positive for the second time. A spokesperson has confirmed that Her Royal Highness is triple vaccinated. A Russian figure skater who failed a drugs test at the Winter Olympics in Beijing has been told she can continue to compete at the event. 15-year-old Camilla Valivaye was would have been the youngest athlete to be banned for the do for doping during the Olympic Games. But a court of arbitration says the teenager's case is an exceptional circumstance and no provisional suspension should be imposed. A public inquiry into the wrongful conviction of sub-postmasters and mistresses of theft, fraud and false accounting begins today. Over 700 former employees were falsely accused because of a flawed accounting computer system that the post office branches used called Horizon. The inquiry will look at whether the post office knew about the IT issues and its handling of them. And unvaccinated teenagers can now travel to Spain as long as they have a negative PCR test result. The country's reversed its policy demanding that UK visitors aged between 12 and 17 had to be double jabbed. The change coincides with the start of half term, which for many in the UK begins today. You're now up to date here on GB News, but on your TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. After a short break, we'll be back to the briefing with Gloria. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. 
And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back. It's time for one of my very special interviews with MPs where we go behind the politics and get to know the real person. Today is Valentine's Day and I spoke to Conservative MP Caroline Dynage, who is celebrating today her wedding anniversary, her eighth wedding anniversary, to former MP Mark Lancaster. She talks about marrying her best friend and also her biggest regret as an MP, not voting for equal marriage. Caroline Dynage, Dame Caroline Dynage, newly. Yes, I know. How does it feel? Weird, very weird and unexpected. It, I, I didn't get a letter to let me know that it was coming down the track. So this is going to sound very glamorous and I apologise in advance. I was on my way back from a New Year's Eve party. Uh, my 14 year old son was hangry in the back of the car and so we stopped off at a kebab shop on the way home and I went in to uh, get him some food and my husband was in the car outside checking, uh, parked up, checking the, uh, you know, the internet as one does and sent me a text message to say, you're on the New Year's Honours list. And so the first I knew of it was in a kebab shop in Gosport while wearing a tutu, actually. So, you know, glamorous. <laughs> you're very glamorous. Okay. Do you use the title? Not so far. No, I, I haven't done it so far. It, it, mm, it, I'm, still, I'm still a little bit, uh, I'm still a little bit imposter syndrome. I still feel it's kind of not, it's not quite me. I haven't sort of, I haven't expanded to fill the title yet. So you grew up with a dad on the television. Yeah. Tell us about your dad and what, what that was like. Well, I, I've been thinking about this a, a lot of, of late because my dad has just stood down from presenting um, the Meridian News after uh, 54 years on the telly, right? So I would, people have asked me a lot recently, you know, what, what was it like, etc., etc. And uh, the thing is, I, I never knew anything different. I, I, you know, my, my dad was always on the telly uh, as a child. And it was only really as I sort of began to grow up a little bit that I realised that he did a job that was just a bit odd in the sense that when I was very little, he was presenting how, uh, you know, it's a children's TV and he used to do a lot of experiments and he was famous for getting them wrong uh, and making a fool of himself. And so he used to bring these experiments home and, you know, so it was only gradually over, over a period of time that it sort of occurred to me that that wasn't what other people's dads did for a job. And then Auntie Bunty, who was up, Bunty James, who was one of the co-presenters on How, used to stay with us, because it was live in those days, How, and she used to stay with us. And uh, so it, it was a, you know, I grew up kind of presuming that that's what everybody's parents did. And so it, it, it never seemed like an odd thing to me. And, and I guess my, my kids had a similar sort of thing in that their granddad was on the telly and then their mum also occasionally popped up on TV as well. So, you know, it, it's a, an odd thing to grow up in a world where that's what your family do, isn't it? It was interesting oh, when I was reading about you that you went to private school and comprehensive. Yeah. Why was that and what was the difference? Well, I, I went to private school till I was 16 and then I went to a state sixth form. Um, well, it was a state school that had a sixth form. In fact, Penny Mordaunt was the year below me at school. So I've known Penny since we were 16 and 15, um, uh, respectively. And uh, it was just local and it's where all my friends went and it was great. I absolutely loved my sixth form. Yeah, really, really good and made some great friends, one of whom to this day is godmother of my kids and still one of my besties. Was there a contrast? You leave a private school and you go to a state sixth form. Did you, did you feel it? I always say that uh, I was really pleased that I, um, I didn't stay in the private sector post 16 because I think 
I think it's really important to, you know, if you're in a private school, inevitably you're surrounded by kids who come from quite a privileged background. And most of my mates in the village where I was brought up didn't. They went to the local state school. And, but I think a lot of my friends were surrounded by you know, other kids who were similarly privileged. And I think it's really important to understand that you are privileged when you're young. You know, it's really important to sort of grow up knowing that not everybody has those advantages. Uh, and also my brilliant uh, state school sixth form just taught me how to work without someone necessarily chivying along behind me, encouraging me to work, work under my own steam. And when you go to university, that is invaluable, isn't it? When did you decide you were a conservative? Ah. Now, this, is, this, this will be a different story from the one that you've heard from some of my colleagues. It wasn't as a, it wasn't as a child. Um, in fact, it was after I'd been asked to stand to be a local councillor. Uh, so I didn't get involved in politics because I didn't get involved in politics. I was a local councillor, but not because I was political. I got involved because of a local issue, and one of my I ran a business. I had my own business since I was 19, and uh, one of my customers, who was a fabulous gentleman by the name of John Maxwell, who was a retired brigadier, uh, we often used to just you know shoot the breeze, talk about politics. I'm, I'm, I've always been, you know, in Portsmouth we might say gobby, a little bit outspoken, and uh, we, I was complaining about a local issue, and he, unbeknown to me, was the chairman of the local Conservative branch, and he said, if you don't like it, why don't you do something about it? And I said, well, you know, how would one even begin to do something about that? And he said, well, why don't you stand for election? We've got elections coming up in that part of the world. We haven't got a candidate. Why don't you be our candidate? Uh, so, naively, I thought to myself, well, you know, that would be something to tell my grandchildren one day that I stood in an election. And I was pretty, you know, we, I'd pretty much been reassured by a lot of the local membership that I didn't have any chance of winning it. It was 1998. Can you remember how desperately yeah, yeah. unpopular it how? was to be a Tory in 1998? <laughs> yes. so I how old were you at that? 25. And I would go out, I, I went out knocking on doors every single night, and I wore it absolutely heaved it down with rain every single night in my memory, maybe didn't in real life. I wore this bright yellow raincoat and I just presumed that the reason I got elected was that I lulled everybody into a false sense of security thinking I was a Lib Dem walking up their drive. But I'd somehow, I somehow won the, won the election. I was the only Tory gain in Winchester Council that night and I was the youngest ever in Winchester's thousand year council history. So, you, I mean, you're right to point out, 1998, joining the Tories in 1998 was yes. not a fashionable thing to do. No. D did you vote, did you always vote, con did you always vote before and did you always vote Conservative before? Uh, I suppose there's only a couple of elections you'd have had. I think I, I can't really remember. I'd never been, so I'd always been interested in politics but not party political. Yeah. You know, my dad's, a, my dad's in your line of work. He's a journalist, and you, 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 a, yeah. a TV journalist, and you can't really be... So I, even now, I don't know how my dad votes. University, I'd been um, news editor of the university paper, so I hadn't been sort of wildly political there either. I kind of always went by the people rather and you know who I trusted right so actually at university I actually went out door knocking for a friend of mine who was standing to be the welfare officer with a labour ticket so you know I, because I loved her and it hadn't really occurred to me up until that point. It's interesting <laughs> well it's better than writing on the you know like a five years old I want to be prime minister yeah well I think. <laughs> yeah and you know and, and then when I got elected suddenly my eyes were open to this world of of politics and I and I you know I had my own business so I, I guess I sort of naturally fell into that bracket otherwise he wouldn't have asked me to stand would he? So you were elected in 2010 same time as me? Yes. Um, have you, you forgiven me yet for getting you to do the, um, the Macmillan tug of war? Oh my gosh I forgot about that. Yeah. No I was terrible at it. There was a... I don't know why I was terrible <laughs> at doing a tug of war. Anyway it turns out I can't be a tug of war and I wouldn't have known that had it not been for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> same, same. It was a learning curve. I lost every single fake nail I had that day. I've never worn them since. <laughs> um, we have very different experiences because I spend all my time in opposition. Yes. Whereas you spend six and a half years as a government minister. Yeah. So you're promoted quickly yeah, to well, the government. Yeah, well, 2015, so I'd been in five years before I got promoted. So I wasn't one of the first of my intake. Uh, and hadn't, you know, had always been a little bit of a rebel. I hadn't had an entirely clean sheet. Um, uh, and actually, 
you know, got into politics because I really wanted to be a great constituency MP. Yeah. I never had any wild ambitions. From, you know, for me, having actually just become an MP was, you know, exciting <laughs> enough without yes. having any aspirations towards being minister um, into ministerial life. But, yeah, I was really, really very fortunate. Six and a half years, six different government departments, uh, three prime ministers. I just think they forgot I was there. So last year you are reshuffled yes. out of the government yes under boris johnson how does that feel what happens uh, well in my case uh it was not unexpected because i'd been called into downing street for a chat then <clears throat> around about june july time and they said what do you want to do next and i i to be honest with you i just said look uh I've, I've loved it, um, and I loved the job I was in at the time, digital and, and mm. culture, and I would have happily stayed doing that. Uh, but I didn't want another sideways move because six different government departments, it takes, I think, at least six months to get up to speed on a, a new portfolio. I remember I got reached the first time in the Department of Work and Pensions, I was doing a debate where I really felt I knew what I was talking about. I remember looking down at my phone halfway through and there was a WhatsApp message saying, can you go straight to number 10 afterwards? And that I got reshuffled on that very day. And I remember in my head thinking, that's this is the first day I know what I'm talking about. So I just, I just said at that point, um, I just don't want another sideways move. So, uh, so I knew pretty much that it was, it was coming down the track. So it wasn't, it wasn't an unexpected phone call, which helps, I think. Weren't upset? No. Oh, and I have not, so far, touch wood, there has not been a single day where I regret that decision. Now, let's get personal. Okay. If that is okay. So your marriage breaks down while you're an MP, your marriage to the father of your children. Your private life, of course, that, that's reported in the press. Mm. And obviously marriage breakdowns are, by their very nature, difficult and traumatic mm. episodes. And it's talked about in the press. How do you, how do you deal with that? Uh, it's, it's really difficult. And actually, um, my marriage broke down quite a long time before it was spoken about in the press. And I took a view just not to talk to anybody about it. So I'd, um, uh, uh, I'd filed for divorce and then didn't tell anybody. I didn't even tell anybody in my family because I just didn't want to have that conversation in public. Mm. Uh, obviously, I told the man I was divorcing, but um, so it's really hard, and so quite and quite often. So then, when I started dating Mark, we probably started dating, I guess, towards the end of 2012. Mark Lancaster Mark, is, a, is a colleague elected. Yes. Is he elected in 2010? As he was 20, 20, 2005. 2005. So he is a, one, a parliamentary colleague, another Conservative MP. Yeah. So we sort of we we had been just really good friends, just literally from the minute we met in 2010, we were just mates, and uh, I was married, he was engaged, uh, you know, uh, and we just hit it off and just became pals and for years and years and we were just pals and then we, we uh, started dating but people in parliament knew it wasn't as it wasn't a secret and yet the papers only seemed to find out about six months later and so when Mark was doorstepped sort of about six months after we started dating and one of the tabloids said to him I put it to you that you're dating Caroline Dynage his comment was absolutely so we were fortunate in that, but it was weird in that our personal life was kind of six months ahead of um, our public, the public bit of it. But it's, it is always hard. And actually, at the end of the day, you think about your children mm. more than anything. Mm. You don't want them to read about this stuff or get teased about it at mm. school, which is why I'm really very proud of my ex-husband, never having spoken publicly about uh, our divorce and why I've never spoken publicly about it. Because I've been an MP, so forgive me for asking this question, but I can't, and this happens, people do have relationships in Parliament, but I, I just can't, because the bars are very crowded and I can't imagine how you would get to know someone that, in, yeah. you know, in order for you to, it's a to progress, but. Yeah, we, I mean, it, as I say, it was, it was literally just, we were just really, really good friends. We became almost best friends. Really? And uh, as, you know, I think his, relationship broke down and mine uh, obviously had taken a long period of time uh, we just became you know the friendship grew into something else I was very I, fortunate I married my best friend that's nice yeah because I don't really remember seeing you in the bars actually no you're not really a 
Yeah. To, is that something that you conscious? I suppose you're a minister. So you yeah, and a mum. Uh, yeah. I mean, I wasn't a minister at that point, but I am a mum, and and so you know, I always say that at that point I had I had three jobs. You know, I was a MP, I was a minister. Uh, but I was a mum, and, and the most important of those is being a mum. So when I wasn't in, in Parliament, I was back home with the kids. Do you have any re regrets about anything during those six and a half years as a minister, or during all this time, so you're going into 12 years as a Member of Parliament? Do you ever think, I wish I'd done this differently, or, or perhaps I wish I'd have done, done something that you haven't been able yeah, to? Yeah, <clears throat> my one overarching regret of the whole time I've been an MP and a minister was that I didn't vote to support gay marriage. I didn't vote against it, but I didn't vote to support it. And the reason was that uh, I was just getting tons and tons of mail about it, and because I was, we were quite new, yeah. weren't we, at that yeah. stage? And I was sort of so frightened that I was getting so much mail asking me to vote against it that I didn't dare vote in favour of it. And then, after the first couple of votes, I thought to myself, "Pull yourself together, woman. This is not these people that are writing to you are not speaking for the vast majority of the British public who feel the same way I do. That you know, love is love, and it doesn't matter who who you who you marry." And so after that, the votes that came afterwards, I supported it. But I just wish I hadn't. I, I wish I hadn't been uh, taken down that route. I wish I just believed in myself and believed in my heart and voted for the right thing to do. Because it's you know, it's the one thing that's just troubled me ever since. Interesting. And with that in mind, any new MPs that are coming in, do you have advice to, to them about... Um, cause it can be difficult when you get bombarded. Yes. And it's not really bombardment, because I got loads of emails as well. Yes. But when I say loads, I think it was about 300, because I remember it. Yes. Now that you, you so raised it. So I had it. 500, and, when, mm. and so at the time that feels overwhelming. Yeah. And the fact is that actually I've got... 72,500 constituents. So when you think about it in those terms, obviously it's, it's a tiny, tiny percentage. And obviously sometimes there are some issues which galvanise people to, uh, to get in touch, where those that actually you know, may feel differently may not necessarily be galvanised in the same way. And you have to sort of balance that. I think always the, the advice I would give would be to just take a step back, take a deep breath and just think, what would the silent majority be saying? What, what are my mates saying? What are, you know, the, the people that I know at the school gates saying? And actually, that's your answer. I think that's very good advice. And people coming into Parliament and politics would be wise to listen to that. Thank you very much indeed, Caroline. Dame Caroline Dynage. Thank you very much. Now, last week we saw European scientists have a major breakthrough in their quest for developing nuclear fusion energy. While the world is searching for new ways of producing low carbon emissions energy, will nuclear fusion power be the future? Do joining me now is Dr Joe Milnes, Head of Jet Operations at the UK Atomic Energy Authority. Welcome. Good to see you. Hello. Let's start Thanks by... You. You're very welcome. Let's start by asking you, what is fusion power? Sure. Uh, so fusion power is, uh, is what powers the, all our stars and, and the sun. Um, it's where, if you can get gases hot enough uh, for long enough, they fuse together and produce new elements, heavier elements, and produce um, a lot of energy. And this is the process we're trying to recreate here on Earth. How does it work? So you build a machine. So we are our, our machine here uh, at uh, at Cullum, just outside Oxfordshire, which are called Jet. Is it's a fairly large machine, a, a, a vessel, um, a, a big vacuum vessel, and you evacuate that from with the you take all the air out of it. Then you put a tiny amount of the fuels that you want to fuse, and then you use various ways to to heat those fuels up to about 150 million degrees. And at that at those temperatures. They'll fuse together and produce a new element right. and and, okay. uh, and an awful lot of heat. And, and how long do you think it will take for fusion energy to become a reality for all of us? Sure, this is obviously the question that everyone's interested in. Um, it, you know, we're, I'm fairly confident, we're confident this will happen in, in this first half of the century. Depending on who you ask, 10, 20, 30 years, it's quite hard to predict depending on what breakthroughs might come along. But, but I'm certainly confident I'll see fusion, fusion energy on the grid in my lifetime. In your lifetime, that's good news. But 
it doesn't sound like it's going to be here in time to play a part in the government's commitment to um, for zero emissions by 2035. That would be too optimistic. I, th I think so. I mean, we, we obviously will look wherever we can to accelerate uh, accelerate it. I think probably uh, we need to look at uh, other sources, renewables, conventional nuclear and, and, and you know efficiency savings. I think that's all going to play a key part in the net zero target on that time frame. But what fusion will do is set us up for, for hundreds, if not thousands of years to come. It'll be the solution for us with kids and grandkids. So, um, you know, we'll accelerate where we can. But I think it will have it won't have a huge impact on those time frames because it's, it, that's just a little bit too close. And just to explain to us finally what the next step is in in your research and your production. So uh, we will con we've got two more years working on Jet, but we, there are a number of other projects that are getting going around the world. There's a big project in the south of France called ITER. The UK has launched a, a, its own project called STEP, which um, and, and those and other projects will build on the, on the phenomenal results that we announced just in the last few days and, and look to design the first sort of power plants where we can put net energy on the grid. So, so uh, we're very excited about where this takes us. Really good to talk to you, Dr. Joe Milnes. Thank you very much indeed for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. You've been watching The Briefing with me, Gloria DiPiero. The show is back every weekday from noon. And I'll be back today at 3 o'clock uh, to cover for Darren McCaffrey. Uh, we've got another Real Me interview there, actually. We've got an interview with Barry Shearman, MP. He was elected in 1979, so there's a lot of historical perspective from Barry. Up next, it's On The Money with Liam Halligan. For now, I'm going to leave you with your weather forecast. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Aidan McGiven. Some seriously stormy weather on the way for later this week, but for the rest of Monday at least, cloudy and breezy. Rain or showers turning a little drier later for a time before more rain arrives overnight. The focus for the wet weather, I think, at first this afternoon across northern England into the Midlands, East Anglia as well. The rain eventually easing away to the east. Further showers follow for Wales, the southwest, parts of Scotland, Northern Ireland as well. Some heavy downpours, some hill snow for Scotland and a brisk breeze. I think temperatures at around 6 to 9 Celsius in the north, perhaps a 10 Celsius in places in the south. Clearing skies then for a time on Monday evening and a touch of frost possible in places before the next bout of cloud and wind and rain arrives from the west by the end of the night. That rain heavy across western parts and falling as snow of the hills of northern England as well as parts of Scotland. But the weather fronts are lined up to the Atlantic to the west of us and these lows will deepen significantly as they arrive from Wednesday onwards. Meanwhile, ahead of these, the weather front across northern and western parts of the country as we start off Tuesday will bring some damp or wet weather in places. It does ease away. It pushes through during the morning, perhaps lingering across southern counties of England for a time into the early afternoon. Brighter skies follow. A brisk wind, again gales in exposed northern and western parts of Scotland and hill snow above around 200 metres in any showers that follow for Scotland and northern England. But some clearer and drier weather for the second half of Tuesday for the southern half of the UK. Then yet more rain arrives to the west on Tuesday night, some heavy rain at times along with a brisk wind. This isn't the stormy weather. I think that's to come on Wednesday night 